Hi, I'm going to talk to you about what I, in my unbiased opinion, think is a very exciting topic, which is uh, simultaneous machine translation using reinforcement learning. So what you see here is a picture of the Nuremberg trials, uh, which was the first widespread usage of this uh, sort of in simultaneous interpretation uh, or real-time interpretation. Uh, so what they found is that through some calculations that if they were going to do this uh, the old-fashioned way, which is someone speaks an entire sentence and then someone translates the entire sentence, uh, it was, so this would take years. So no one has time for that. So they sort of innovated, although this, this had been done in the past, they innovated uh, this uh, field by using some technology and a lot of people to do this in real time. And more recently, you've, you may have seen some things in the news about uh, various organizations trying to do uh, multilingual video conferencing and these sorts of things. And again, this is going to be much more of an enjoyable experience if we have something that can sort of follow us as the text is coming in or as the words are coming in. So an outline of my talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, SOV to SVO, simultaneous uh, machine translation, uh, which I uh, will describe in a, in a bit and our approach to dealing with that and our reinforcement learning framework that we use to try to tackle this problem, uh, our translation system, and of course our experiments, results, and related work. So what is simultaneous translation? Uh, so as I mentioned, it's when, you, when text or speech, in our case text, when words are coming in, and we, and we want to translate incrementally. So we don't wait until the sentence is complete to start translating. Uh, as I mentioned, this was first introduced during the Nuremberg trials on a large scale. So the, when people do this, it requires uh, a lot of experience and training, and it's actually very mentally taxing uh, when uh, doing this. Um, so we're also going to try to learn to do this from experience. Uh, so most prior approaches to this have been uh, in the context of rule-based systems. Uh, we would like to use machine learning to do this. So by SOV to SVO, I mean subject, object, verb to subject, verb, object. So almost every language, fall, well, the vast majority of languages fall into one of these two categories. Uh, German, for example, is often SOV. English is almost always SVO. Uh, so we want to do this for these sorts of languages, which presents a unique problem. Uh, because verbs are extremely important. And you generally can't have a complete sentence without a verb. Uh, so if we wait for the verb to end, so in this example, in this German example, the last verb is, and forgive my pronunciation, gefahren. If we were to wait for that, uh, and it means traveled, uh, then we would just be doing trans normal translation after the sentence is complete, and we don't want to do that. So our approach is to instead try to predict the verb. Uh, so we try to predict the verb so that we'll have a more grammatical sentence in the end and a more grammatical fragment on the way to the end of the sentence. Uh, so to do this, we use standard language models. So here we have some German sentences that end in verbs. And we essentially divide up the corpus and build a language model for each verb. And this, basically what this means is that we take the language model that maximizes the probability of the context that we, that we have observed up to that point. And we choose that as our verb to predict. Uh, so as you might imagine, this doesn't always work well, and so this will lead to bad translations if we pick the wrong verb. So we have to learn when to trust these and when not to trust them. Uh, so we want to learn under which circumstances we trust these predictions and when we should not trust these predictions. Uh, so to do this, uh, we are going to use reinforcement learning and learn a policy that we call PI in order to do this. So. In reinforcement learning, you typically have actions that, that take you to a new state, or you have, you have states and you can take actions in those states. In our, in our system, uh, we have observations, which are the words that are coming in, and we, ha we have predictions about what the future input is going to be. So we, we predict what the verb is going to be, and we predict what, the next wo what we think the next word will be. Uh, the more important of those is the verb. And our actions are wait, so this does not produce any output. 
Uh, so a new word comes in and we decide we don't have enough confidence to do anything with that, so we produce nothing. We just wait for more information. We wait for more words. Uh, we have a verb action, which takes our current best guess for the verb and applies it to our translation to try to get ahead of the speaker. Well, we're not using speakers per se, but to get ahead of the text that's coming in. And we have also a next word prediction or a next word action that does something similar. And we have a commit, which doesn't use the predictions, but, but just uh, tries to translate the, what we've observed up to that point. So just to give you a sort of visual interpretation of this, if we have the input here uh, and we have a verb prediction, uh, if we take a wait action, then we don't produce any output if we commit. And I did not make this up. This is what a popular uh, mach uh, machine translation system produced. Uh, when I type this in, you get something terrible. But we want, what we want to do is to apply our verb prediction in order to get a reasonable uh, partial translation. So in reinforcement learning, typically you have a reward. And uh, so what we want to try to optimize are two things. Uh, we want quality, we want tr good translations, but we want them with low latency. So we don't want translations that in the end are terrible because we were too aggressive in translating the segments. And we also don't want to wait until the end of the sentence in order to translate because that's not incremental. So to do this, we use blue as a basis uh, for obvious reasons. It's the standard metric for many languages. And uh, so we calculate blue for each segment that we have. So every time we commit to a translation, uh, we, we have a reward based on this metric. And then over time, we can take a discrete integral of, of these uh, scores to get our score for the entire sentence. And the intuition here is that a, is that a translation that has uh, accuracy and expeditiousness will give us a higher score in the end. And so the end score, which is, the, which is cumulative, is what we care about in the end. So if we can imagine what our ideal system would be, it, we could call it a psychic translator. Uh, this is impossible. Uh, but it's helpful for thinking about what's, uh, what's going on here. So a psychic translator would function like this. Uh, we utter word, one word in German, in this case, er, and it reads my mind and predicts the rest of the sentence. Clearly, this is impossible, and so this policy would claim all of the area under the curve uh, by the end. We can also imagine a policy that is extremely aggressive in that it sort of naively translates every word as it comes in in German, and thus we end up with a, an English sentence with German word order. And we can sort of see that it's sort of getting scores as it goes along because this, these are matching n-grams, basically. Uh, but uh, the translation in the end is sort of questionable. We can also imagine a batch translator, which is just another way of describing the traditional machine translation system. So what this does is that it waits until it has all of the information, that is, it has seen the end of the sentence, and then it translates based on that. So this is not incremental, but it's helpful as a baseline. And this is what we want to do. So we want the best of, bo the best of both worlds in, in between batch and monotone. So we want something that can make predictions as these words are coming in, apply them early, and then over time, we get a, a, a translation that is reasonable on the, on the way to the end and also gives us a, a more grammatical translation at the end. And if you just, as a visual, one more time going through this, you can imagine how this score works. So for our translation system, we assume a black box. Thus, there is a black box here. Um, so the, 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 key, the key to this is that we don't allow corrections. So we can't uh, go back and change our mind once we observe new information. And the advantage to doing this is that it allows us to, to concentrate on the learning problem rather than the translation problem. 
So it, we could potentially replace a translation system with a different one and, and do something else. And so the way the one the way this works is this. So text is being translated. So we have he here, and then we see oh it should have been it, but we've already committed to he, so we can only append uh, words to the end of what we've had. So this. A uh, graphic is intended to show what it might, what learning a good policy might look like. So in this case, we've observed a partial uh, German sentence, and we have a state in which we have a verb prediction, and we have a next word prediction. So after this, the system decides to wait uh, because it has determined that uh, we don't have enough information. So if we, get, we get some more words, our predictions change, we wait, uh, we get some more words, our predictions change, and then we decide to use a prediction. So we use the verb prediction, and then we commit to that translation. And now we have I traveled by train to, and then we wait, and then we uh, commit to another translation, and we have our output. And based on the decisions that were made, uh, we get some reward, and this allows us to learn a policy that will hopefully generalize to, um, to other kinds of situations. So we use imitation learning. Uh, so given our predictions, uh, we uh, want to, we, what we do is we, we discover the optimal policies in hindsight. So one of the problems uh, that is, often comes up in these kinds of uh, apprentice and teacher situations is that the teacher is too good. Uh, so, if you can imagine that a, an optimal policy does something like this, where it, it does exactly what it should, but our policy that we're trying to learn is, is naive, um, well, this, this, it's hard to learn from this if the optimal policy is never in the situations in which the learning policy is in. So what we do is that we interpolate uh, based on these policies to end up so that we can explore the state space, or rather so that we can learn from a policy that is in situations like what we'll actually be in. So the algorithm for doing this, uh, is we use CERN. Uh, so we initialize with an optimal policy that we call pi star, and we set that to our initial policy. And until convergence, uh, we, ex we generate examples that, uh, that are state action pairs, and we generate a classifier based on this to map our states to our actions. And then we calculate a reward that is the difference between the, the, uh, the optimal policy reward and our current, or I'm sorry, our, pre our previous iterations policy reward and our current policies reward. So what this means is that with probability uh, lambda, we choose the, the previous policy and with the probability one minus lambda, we choose uh, the current iterations policy. <laughs> So what this does is that it allows us, as I mentioned, to explore a state, it, it allows us to explore a state space in which uh, the optimal policy and the uh, learning policy on the first iteration and the subsequent policies, which are slowly deviating from the op optimal policy, um, are similar enough such that um, meaningful learning can take place. So for our experiments, uh, we use the DE News Corpus, which consists of uh, daily news uh, transcriptions. Uh, so we limited this to only verb final sentences in German. Um, and uh, so we did this because we wanted to emphasize uh, the verb predictive aspect of this. And so now I'm going to show you some results from our experiments. So this is our batch policy, which predictably uh, only gets uh, credit at the end. So first of all, the x-axis is the percent of the sentence that has been revealed. So these are the words are coming in, and that's, that's what this uh, exemplifies. And the y-axis is the average, the cumulative average of the rewards as those words are coming in. So the final score is the, is the actual score for the sentence. So what we are looking for is over here. And this tells us what the reward is as we're leading up to that point. If we look at the monotone policy, we get a sort of steady increase, um, which, but it does worse than the batch policy because the translation quality is bad. 
And if we look at the optimal policy, uh, as we would expect, it's higher than all the others consistently. And if we look at our learned policy, which is this cross here, uh, we beat the baselines because we are making informed decisions that we learn about when to use uh, when to use our predictions and when to wait for more information and when to translate. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that since we're using a blue-based metric, this introduces uh, some uh, shortcomings in, ho in how, so some things don't get credit that should. And so in this example, the, sorry about that. So in this example, the verb uh, gesagt is predicted and used. Uh, and so this is translated as shown. Uh, when, ex when in fact the, the actual verb is presented. So on the right side, this is actually a very reasonable translation because shown is very semantically near to presented, but we don't get credit for this because we're using blue. Um, so this is a potential avenue of future research. I just wanna say a few words about related work. So uh, there, was a there was a paper by Ora et al. in 2014 uh, where they learned segmentations uh, using search and dynamic programming. Um, so, like I said, we used reinforcement learning to try to do this, um, and we are doing verb prediction. Uh, so, there, are, there were some previous attempts to do simultaneous machine translation in uh, the 90s, uh, and more recently, uh, there have been some attempts to do this as well, but there haven't been any attempts to do verb prediction recently. The only attempt that we are aware of was by Matsubara et al. in a rule-based system that used uh, pattern matching to predict the uh, English verb. And for future work, uh, of course, we'd like to do better with our verb predictions, and we'd like to use a more sophisticated translation system as well. Uh, and we'd like to incorporate a richer feature space into our uh, model so that we can make more informed decisions uh, and uh, predict things other than verbs, perhaps. We'd also like to try this for languages such as Japanese, for which blue is generally not a great idea, and uh, maybe use some more semantic-centric uh, metrics like MENT. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, so it seems like your system uh, can get better translations even if you only care about the translation at the end. Is that right? Or did I, did I uh, uh, misunderstand the plot? If, even if you only care about, so, so even, the, even if you only care about the batch setting, it seems like, you're, like your system can give you better translations than the batch algorithm. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. Okay. Uh, so, um, so we're learning when do you trust predictions. Um, to produce better output. It's not clear to me what advantage that would give to a batch system. Um, um, uh, so, so I guess what I'm saying is uh, it seems like this is maybe just a better algorithm for machine translation um, uh, than just doing batch. But maybe uh, uh, that's just stemming from the reward, maybe n like not equating to, to blue. Um, uh, so I, I think we haven't really tackled the translation problem itself so much is uh, the uh, sort of incremental decision-making process uh, right. based on a black box translation system. Um, so I, there may, I'm sure there are ways to apply this to standard machine translation. I just haven't thought of them. OK, yeah, <laughs> yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you'd considered how humans go about doing the simultaneous translation process and you know when they decide to wait, when they decide to actually predict what's coming up and so on and whether or not you could use maybe transcripts and, or time transcripts in order to inform your learning. We absolutely have and are thinking about that. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of uh, interesting data out there and there's a lot of, uh, there's some studies in psycholinguistics about verb selection uh, as well uh, in these kinds of languages, and there are new ones coming out uh, recently. Um, so we definitely like to look into that. Uh, for this, we're not necessarily imitating humans, we're imitating an optimal policy, uh, but that would, that's certainly an area that we would like to explore. Yeah, um, yeah I've got a question. Um, 
how, how I'm new to this area of work, so I'm, excuse me if my question's a bit naive. Um, how does the, a system like this deal with relative closes? <laughs> <laughs> so we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, so currently, uh, we don't uh, really deal with relative clauses. So uh, we tried to limit our sentences in size so that we wouldn't have to deal with too many of those. Uh, but yeah, we're not currently doing anything sophisticated with relative clauses, but that, uh, that's obviously an issue in these head final languages, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Could you imagine using the uncertainty of your prediction, say, of what the verb is to come as one of the sources of input as to whether or not to wait or omit it? We are doing that, and I probably did not make that clear enough. Uh, so we are all, part of this data is also the probability of the prediction. Um, so it's on the slide, but I may have glossed over it. But yes, we are doing that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so there are more sophisticated things that we can probably do as well. So that's along the lines of the kind of entropy over the distribution of the possible verbs. Right. Yeah. What is the accuracy of the verb? Uh, I mean, it does seem to me that <laughs> you are in a language modeling with a task in mind mm -hmm. because there's a conversation going on. And so like, it's not just plain language modeling. I mean, yeah. You're in. But nothing prevents you from looking at uh, the previous history of the conversation. Right. Even though you try to learn a policy, mm -hmm. uh, the more you improve the verb predictor, the better that thing will work. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I think your intuition about how difficult verb prediction is also exactly right. <laughs> um, and that language models in and of themselves are not. So I can't, tell, I can't give you a number right now, but I can tell you that it's not very good. <laughs> and that uh, it, it, we want to do better, yeah. There's also some research on recurrent neural networks with gating, things like long short-term memories and so on that may be kind of of interest here for carrying forward um, very long histories of structure from earlier on in the discourse. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.